This episode of Shaun of the South is brought to you by Case Knives, a tradition of my family dating back to my granddaddy who once said the best cure for idle hands was to build something. So keep your hands sharp with a Case Knife. And by WNC Original Music, my buddy Ron Taylor at WNC Original Music curates the music for this show every single week, bringing to you the best bands in America, independent and otherwise. Do yourself a favor and visit my buddy, WNC Original Music Podcast. You will not regret it. And by Folklore Brewing and Meadry, quite literally, the best brew in Alabama. Visit FolkloreBrewingAndMeadry.com. And now let's have a tune from Charles Latham. Staring at a blank page and fill it up with dirty words. Gonna write a letter like the kind you never heard And it's got some eighth grade emotion And some fifth grade spelling mistake Probably never send it But I'll stamp it just in case What you're reading Now was that summer trip It's polite to start a letter In the interrogative And if I tell you how I've been doing I'll probably bury it at the end Start to sign it alone Across that album book To your friend Send it Pony Express I wear it in the battle Pinned unto my breast And it's every third word that matters And if you read between the lines And get a handwriting expert It's a window to the mind And I may never Surprise, but I'm crossing all my T's and I'm dotting all the I's. I'm gonna write a good old fashioned letter. a sender but you know that it's from me this portion of our program is brought to you by visitnorthalabama.org, the Mountain Lakes Tourist Association. Visit the 16 North Alabama counties and make this state what it is. The North Alabama Hallelujah Trail features 32 churches that are at least 100 years old and standing on their original sites, still holding public services, all accessible to the public. These are the portrait of North Alabama's history and tell the remarkable story of early Alabamans from the early days, the Hallelujah Trail. Whatever you do, you can do it better at North Alabama. So visit NorthAlabama.org or visit North Alabama at hashtag visit North AL. Let me take you for granted just like air or gravity all my Are invisible to me. So let me take you for granted. Let me take you for granted. 
the outrageously selfish and foolish man I am. Let me take you for granted. Let me take Somebody new Without understanding That love's just exchanging Little parts of her Little parts of you And you may take that for granted take a second and interrupt this broadcast and talk to you about a serious issue facing many Americans today. To many Americans, this issue is even more important than the bothersome notion of secondhand smoke. And of course, I am talking about secondhand whistling. Now, many people on job sites and out in public walking on the sidewalks whistle melodies without a particular melody in mind. This means they are absolutely choosing notes at random and whistling them without any consideration for those standing around them. Whistling a melody without actually having a melody is like speaking without actually using coherent thought choosing words at random that are totally random neural firings. This is madness, and we ask you to consider those around you before whistling. Please choose a melody that is something recognizable that we can all listen to without pulling our hair out. This has been a message from the Foundation for Whistling Without a Melody.
getting painted baby blue Fifteen years into my five-year plan Looking every day more like Peter Pan But I'm lonesome tonight, oh I'm lonesome blue But you're here with me now, I ain't missing you Well, you are listening to Sean of the South, and I'm your host today, Sean Dietrich, and man, it's a bona fide pleasure, as it is always, every week, coming to you live with the podcast airwaves and the radio waves all over this fine nation, or through your stereo speakers in your car, or while you're on the way to work, or while you are running away and trying to get out of the state so that your family can never find you again, because if you have to drive your kids to soccer practice one more time in that carpool, that godforsaken carpool that smells bad inside side with 14 stinky kids who've been sweating all day and they're throwing their their electronic devices uh, across the car to each other and hitting you upside the head and you're driving and you're riding out of the state forever and you've chosen to listen to this here is my my message to you just keep on going you can always come back a little later. They don't need to, they don't need mom or daddy right now. They can do without you for a little bit. You deserve a little bit of time to yourself. Because you're an adult, and adults just deserve this sort of thing. They deserve to be alone every now and then. They deserve to feel as though they are a a separate entity in the universe, as opposed to being conjoined to their spouse and their children and their dogs and their cats and their, their house chores and work and whatever. You deserve to be, to feel like a human being and sometimes you can't feel that way unless you are all by yourself and then you start to really feel your adultness come through and it's hard turning into an adult you have waited for this for a long time we grow up through the pain of toddlerhood where we can't figure out how to to use a toilet And that that, that complicates life a lot. But finally, we learn how to do that after suffering and many, many years of training and, and perfecting our aim. And then we are in our childhood where we are not part of the human race, really. No child is part of the club. We are always outsiders looking inside to this adult world and, and everything they do and everything they're into, we can't be into and we, we're not allowed to hear. And my mother, she said it once, she said it tw- 100 million times, little pictures of big ears. I never knew why a pitcher that you would pour water out of would have ears at all. It took me a long time to realize she was saying picture. Little pictures have big ears. That makes even less sense to me, but whatever. Then you leave childhood. And you are now a teenager. This is the worst period of your life, interspersed with the greatest moments of your life. And then after that, you become a a, a, a quasi-adult. And now it's a dangerous territory because you look like an adult on the outside, but you are a child or worse, a teenager on the inside. And you think you've got the brain of an adult, but you really don't. You are, have just figured out how to cut your own lawn and put yourself on a lawn cutting schedule. That is when you really know uh, that adulthood is real. But there is a time in everybody's life. There is a moment in everybody's life when they become a true adult. Now, I'm not talking physically adult. I'm not talking when their body turns into an adult. And I'm not talking about 
a full entrance into adulthood, such as when you get your driver's license or when you are old enough to to, you know, argue politics with your father in law. No, what I'm talking about is there is a moment in your life when you have ceased to belong to the childhood club and now you are a full on adult in your mind. The rest is just catching up. You might have that moment in your life. You might be able to think back and, and actually pinpoint it. For some people, it's kind of hard to pinpoint. But for me, I know exactly when it happened. I know exactly when it happened. I know exactly the road we was on when it happened. Now, barbecue is very important to my people. Barbecue is very, it's paramount. I grew up among barbecue people. Now, I meet a lot of people in my travels uh We've gone to 30 states this past year, and I have tasted barbecue in just about every state of the union in my lifetime. And definitely this past year, I've, I've tasted it in, in over half the states in the United States. And I count this as the greatest privilege of my life. I truly do. I love barbecue. I come from people who, when they had family reunions, would make this huge grill out of cinder blocks in the dirt, one cinder block high, and then they would put the hot coals underneath a big piece of chain link fence slung over these cinder blocks and covered with a big sheet of sheet metal. And they did this because there was no way to find a grill that was big enough to cook for all the hungry fat people in my family so they had to build this grill and it was wonderful to watch my father tend that grill i grew up learning how to respect barbecue people do barbecue differently you go in the south you're going to see pork pork shoulder pork butt this is what you see you go to texas they're gonna they're gonna barbecue brisket they don't even they don't do a whole lot of pork you can get good barbecue in Alabama just stopping at these little convenience stores, these little shacks. You can get pulled pork that is just enough to make your hair fall out. You go to Texas, you can go to little gas stations and you can get beef brisket that would just knock your socks off. You go up even higher to South Carolina, they got this different flavor barbecue sauce. You go to North Alabama, you got this white barbecue sauce that a lot of people aren't familiar with. It's made out of Duke's mayonnaise. I'll say no more about it. Just research it. If you ain't never had white barbecue sauce, I love white barbecue sauce. Good God Almighty, have mercy. Well, as a boy, there was nothing more American and important to my family than going to barbecue joints. Now, the barbecue joint is an expressly American thing. They don't have these in Canada. They don't have these in Mexico. I'm not even sure if they have these in Alaska yet, though I'm sure they probably are getting, getting hip to it. No. This is American, the barbecue joint. Now, barbecue joint is not one of them flashy things that you see with the big old neon signs and, and the fine looking outside that's made to look old and aged. But really, you know, this is owned by a corporation. I won't name any names, but you know who I'm talking about. There are all sorts of places that sell themselves as barbecue joints. That is not a barbecue joint. That is a franchise. I'm talking about the little tiny pine wood shack way out in the middle of nowhere that is operated by girls and boys who still wear their high school colors while standing behind the cash register they only have two or three things on the menu they make their own barbecue sauce and when they serve it sometimes it's a little bit hot this is a barbecue joint. They hadn't put the sauce away that's sitting on the table in those recycled ketchup bottles in 10 years, and it ain't never killed nobody yet. That's a barbecue joint. And my family used to frequent one particular barbecue joint way out on the edge of town. It was a, it was a place that was one story, and it was in the middle of nowhere, and the only thing that was around it was this little filling station about, uh, I don't know, 500 yards away. And it was the kind of filling station when you pulled in, attendants would come out. 
one attendant actually would come out and he'd he'd squeegee your windshield and he'd top off your tank and you'd you'd pay him and that was it today it's you know totally that that doesn't even make sense if you're a child listening to this you have no idea what i just described to you it's called full service gas station today it's self-service you might google it it will it will uh it will be interesting to you because there was a time when men used to squeegee your windshield that's the time i'm taking you back to this barbecue joint was beautiful it had all the things going for it that all good barbecue joints should have it had a gravel parking lot that was filled with nothing but trucks with muddy fenders and rust on the tailgates and cracked windshields it had girls who worked there who were high school age who wore their high school colors and their hair was pulled back but not in a hairnet like you would have to do in a franchise. It was just pulled back and tied with a scrunchie during this era, at least in my childhood. Some of these hairstyles we, our girls wore, were, well, they wouldn't be considered very fashionable today. They had uh, big old bangs that, that were large enough to park a Chevy underneath. And they had crinkle cut hair that looked, made it look like crinkle cut french fries. And it was fried, dyed, and laid to the side. And anything went when it came to the ponytail. You could have a ponytail shoved out the side of your head just above your temple, or you could have one coming right out your forehead. That's how girls dressed, and they wore big old high-waisted pleated jeans, stone-washed. And these girls would run around, and they would serve people in this barbecue joint. My father loved this barbecue joint for one reason, not just the barbecue, but because he was a tight wad. And there were two things in this barbecue joint that appealed to a tight wad. There was one. A salad bar. Now, the salad bar was making its appearance on the national culinary scene during this era. The salad bar you might take for granted today, but back then it was revolutionary. A salad bar featured all you can eat stale vegetables and you could eat them until Jesus came back and douse them with as much ranch blue cheese thousand island or french's salad dressing as you please now i don't know who invented french's salad dressing but i'd rather lick a mule between the ears and eat french's my father loved this for that reason and because at the end of the salad bar there was something that was pretty revolutionary for the salad bar idea even it was hot soup all you can eat salad all you can eat soup and one of these soups was cheddar cheese beer soup i don't know if you've ever had cheddar cheese beer soup you need to make it one of the goals in your life even if you have dairy allergies you ought to make this your very last meal if that's the case because beer cheese soup is incredible and if you are a tight wad like my father was, you really appreciate it because you can fill up on salad, ranch style salad dressing, extra cheese and, and, and all sorts of fixings and then fill up on beer cheese soup. And then all you need to to top it off barbecue wise is just this little bitty, you know, piece of pork. Well, he loved this place. My father was tight. A lot of men used to say that his friends, he'd say he was so tight that you could feed him a handful of copper pennies and wait a little bit and get number two copper wire out the back end i'm sorry if that uh, if that doesn't land well with you i'm just telling you i'm just telling you what people said about him he really really was tight my father was so tight that when he wasn't looking at anything he took his glasses off <laughs> Well, we would drive to this barbecue joint on the weekends, and I, I have golden memories of going across the faded world toward this place way out yonder in the distance. And I loved crawling out my family station wagon and, and walking up with my feet crunching on the gravel into this pine wood joint that smelled like heaven probably will smell. I think the smell of a good barbecue joint with that hickory and pecan smoke wafting into your nostrils is one of the most glorious things ever created. It's the smell that gets you. I mean, it's almost better than the sandwiches themselves, the pulled pork sandwiches and all sorts of things. Well, we were driving along and it was a sunny day. 
But my mother was sitting in the front seat. My father was driving. There was no music on. We didn't listen to much music. They were just talking, my mother and father. I saw the field passing by us, and we were getting deeper and deeper into the country, and the sky was blue, and the sun was shining, the clouds were out. And then, out of nowhere, we heard this huge slap. It was a slap sound from the front of the car. And my father looked at my mother, and my mother looked at my father, and there was this, this tenseness in the car that we had just hit something. And my mother said, oh, my God, you hit a possum. My father said, I did. He looked behind him, and he saw this big old lump on the back, uh, through the back window. He pulled over to get his nerves settled, because my father could be an excitable man. And my mother was just looking at him, and then I was looking at my mother, and we were all just glad to be alive, that, we, that no one had gotten hurt. And in the moment, in this moment of, of high anxiety and, and 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 emotions were tense. My mother said, whew, thank goodness. And my father said, thank goodness, or whatever. And I will never forget it. Time slowed down for me. Everything became slow. And I said, holy shrimp. And I didn't say shrimp. I said something far, far worse. Now, this word was a word I had heard on the playground at least a 100,000 times from Ryan McGee. Ryan McGee would use this word in creative different ways that, that you ain't never heard it used before. He'd use it to describe wildlife and trees. He was just trying it on for size at that age. And it had somehow crept into my subconscious. This is not a word I use. This is not a word I used back then. I, and, and there I was saying, well, you know what I said. And the air in the car got very, very tense. It was like a nuclear explosion had just occurred, and we were suffering the nuclear winter of our lives. And my mother's face became hard, and my father looked over at, at her with this, this mock amazement look of disbelief, and then he turned back to look at me. He said, what did you say? Well... I didn't know how to answer that. First of all, I sure as heck fire wasn't going to repeat it. Uh, and how do you describe this word without actually using it? And so I slunk in my seat a little bit and my mother said, where did you learn that word? Oh, it was all over for me. I knew it was going to happen. They were going to, you know run me out of town or, or kill me or, or do something. You know, Your kids who cuss don't live to, to see another birthday, at least not back in this era. Cussing was, I mean, we weren't allowed to say all sorts of things that you say today uh, if you're a child. Uh, my parents didn't let me say gosh uh, in public, at least, because I was too close to saying God, and that was uh, taking the Lord's name in vain. If I said good Lord, I got in trouble. I was not allowed to say but some of my favorite words today are words I wasn't allowed to say. There is a word describing a flatulent sound that the body makes, beginning with an F and ending with a T, and rhymes with the word art that I was not allowed to say. Uh, there was a popular word going around back then, uh, and I won't even tell you the word because to me it still feels heavy coming out of my mouth, but there was a popular show years later. That became famous on, on some of the music network television stations, cable TV stations. And it was called Beavis and mm -hmm, that. I wasn't allowed to say that. That was a bad, bad, bad word. And I can't really think of why I would want to say it. I mean, it's much more fun to uh, to call somebody a cretin than, than anything else. But, well, whatever. So you can imagine how this word just 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 was a bomb. Well, my mother looked at my father, and she said, you've got to take care of this. In those days, and I had several friends who went through this, uh, especially among fundamentalists, and I was, I was raised among people who were fundamentalists. There's no doubt about it. They, they, their lives were, well, 
their lives were built around all sorts of rules. And, and there were some of these rules you didn't break. When given the chance between sin and dancing, you had to choose sin because dancing, there was no coming back from that. At least you could be forgiven of sin, but dancing, no. Swearing was right up there with dancing. And so I had really, really done something wrong. And in these days, parents would wash their children's mouth out with soap. I remember my buddy Andrew got his mouth washed out with soap, and uh, he was never the same after that. And I remember all my friends remarking, you know, how this had gone for them. It had never happened to me, mainly because I did not use these words. It, and and if, if we were using words like this, we certainly didn't use them around our parents in exclamatory sentences when we hit a possum. So we drove along, and it was very, very quiet in that car. My mother wore a, wore a very stern brow, and my father gripped the steering wheel, staring forward, and he whipped into that little gas station, that filling station, and the man was a teenage boy, like an 18-year-old maybe, with his hat on a little bit sideways, and he's wearing a jumpsuit that men used to wear back then with his name written on the chest. I do miss those days. And he squeegeed the windshield. My father rolled down the window. He said, fill her up. Fill her up. And that boy looked in the window. And he looked at me with locked eyes. And I think that boy could sense that I was going to the gallows. I think he could sense that I was fixing to die. And nobody said a word to me. Nobody even looked at me. And I was just melting in my own juices back there. I, I had no idea what they had in store for me. I had no idea uh, whether or not I would survive it. We kept on driving after he left the filling station. And we got to that barbecue joint. And my father said, you know, I should turn around. I should just turn around right now. My mother said, I think you need to wash his mouth out with soap. There it was. I, I had it now. They were going to wash my mouth out with soap. Good God Almighty. My mother said, you're going to have to do it, John. I can't take him into the girl's bathroom. <laughs> my daddy looked at her. He said, I I I'm not doing it. I you want me to wash his mouth out with soap? And I knew what my father was thinking. My father was a blue-collar steel worker who wore denim and boots every day of his life, and the men on the job sites he worked with said things that were rotten to the core. And I had heard my father use words that would make the words holy shrimp sound like preschool words. He couldn't in good conscience wash my mouth out. That's what was going on in his head. I could see them wheels turning. My mother said, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. He's got to know. My father said, fine, fine, I'll do it. So I crawled out of the car. My mother and my father crawled out of the car. They slapped the door shut. I was sick inside. Oh, I really was. My father grabbed me by the hand. My mother was walking. It was like going to get your last meal before you go to the electric chair. We got into that joint. These smells greeted us, this wonderful smell of smoked pecan and hickory, maybe a touch of mesquite, and the very, very faint smell of of sludge that comes from all food service kitchens that, that gathers on the floor right in the tile grout lines that they, they sweep up every night and mop up, but it's always there. And the smell of, of burning meat. Mm, mm, mm. That woman behind the counter, she asked what we'd have. My father said, we'll go sit in the dining room. We'd like a salad bar. We'd like three pulled pork sandwiches. And she led us to the dining room, and she gave us the plates for the salad bar. We didn't go back to get new plates back then. That's a relatively new concept. No, no, no. We didn't believe in sanitary food service conditions. If one person had the flu, by God, the entire county had the flu, and you got it right there at the salad bar like every good American. Before I could get to the salad bar, my father said, come on with me. Let's go to the bathroom. 
And my mother followed us, and she waited outside the bathroom. And my father let me into the to that little tiny bathroom with the crooked door, and it had a picture of a pig on it, a pig wearing overalls. And the girls' bathroom had a picture of a pig wearing a dress with curly golden locks. And he shut the door, and we were in there in the bathroom, and it had this 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 mirror with fog on it and this old porcelain sink and this plywood divider between the toilet and the urinal. And my father said, do you know what you did? I always ask you what, if you knew what you did before you got your, your punishment. And I said, yes, sir. He said, y you can't say that word. You realize that? I said, yes, sir. Oh, I was, I was trembling. I knew it was coming. He looked around in the bathroom. He knew what he had to do. But there was no soap except what was mounted on the wall. And it was a soap dispenser with that pink liquid soap. And my father had two choices. He could either give me that liquid chemical arsenic and kill me right there. For doing something that he had done himself at least a thousand times that morning probably. Behind closed doors. Yeah, you see, you might not think fundamentalists cuss. Oh, fundamentalists are human folks. When they slam their thumb in the car door, they have earned the right as a human being to say words that aren't just booger. Mm -mm. Fundamentalists, they know these words and they're in there somewhere. So he could either give me this soap or his other choice was to not give me the soap he went with option number two he looked around real quiet like he said listen here your mother's waiting outside and she expects me to wash your mouth out with soap i looked at him i had no idea what he was suggesting at the time because it was starting to dawn on my childhood brain that if he did not wash my mouth out with soap and we walked out and told my mother that he did wash my mouth out with soap. Then we would be lying. Not only would we wake up in hellfire for saying a swear word beginning with the sixth letter of the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, 16th, 19th letter of the alphabet. I apologize for that. Not only would we wake up in hellfire for that. Now we were lying, lying. Good Lord, that's written in the Ten Commandments. My father kind of looked at me and he, he smiled a little bit and winked. He said, if you don't tell nobody, I won't. And I realized something. I was in the club. I'd made it. He said, work up some tears, boy. So I plugged my nose and I tried to increase my blood pressure and I pushed so my face would be all red. And then I thought of something really sad and I was able to work up one or two good, good old drops coming out of my eyes. He nodded his head. He said, all right, come on. And we walked out of that bathroom and I hung my head down and I knew looking back at my father, he smiled and winked at me that I would not go to hell probably, at least not for that. And we went out to that salad bar, and I saw my mother fixing her salad, which consisted of two pieces of lettuce, eight pounds of crushed bacon, and four gallons of ranch-style salad dressing. And my father ate that beer cheese soup, and so did I. And I tasted the taste of that succulent meat melting inside your mouth, reminding you of what heaven's going to be like. And I was truly an adult forever and ever. Amen. And all I can say to that is holy shrimp. Hey, 
thanks for listening to Sean of the South. I've been your host today, Sean Dietrich. And man, it's been a bona fide privilege coming to you. This episode was brought to you by Case and Knives, a tradition of my family dating back to my granddaddy. He once said the best cure for idle hands was to build something. So keep your hands sharp with a case knife. The music you heard behind me today was Charles Latham. Nearly a decade since wandering around Philadelphia and Nashville to Memphis to the UK, this singer-songwriter has returned to North Carolina in late 2014, laying roots down in Durham, where he began working on these songs that you heard today. Do yourself a favor and visit Charles Latham's stuff online. Google him. You will not regret what you download. To find anything more about what I do, you can visit SeanOfTheSouthShow.com, and there you can find archived episodes dating back to our first episode all the way to this thing that you just heard, whatever you call it. It. You just have a terrible taste in podcasts if you got all the way to the end. And while you're there at my site, drop me a line. Tell me about your birthday announcements, wedding invitations, or potluck socials. And I do my best to read them over the air for my friends. And speaking of friends, friends, remember, if it weren't for coffee, your life probably wouldn't even be happening right now. Adios. Adios.